have a special service today. We have uh, our Holy Communion service, and also we have uh, Martin Callum, who is leading most of our service today, and it's his uh, final trial for local preaching. And uh, so we, we hold him before the Lord, and uh, uh, may all go well there. <laughs> Um, so you've received your notice sheets on the way in or electronically, whichever means you have. Um, tomorrow evening there will be the prayer meeting in here at 7 o'clock, so all, all welcome. Um, and uh, there is lunch today after the service and then uh, we carry on with discipleship explored this afternoon. Um, the craft group, which is advertised on the notices, unfortunately won't be running until further notice uh, due to uh, many commitments. So uh, we'll let you know when that resumes. Richard. And Bible readers, um, you notice each week there are a couple of people who come forward to read our uh, scriptures for us. And we're looking to expand that list of people. And uh, anybody can, can do that. If you need to sit in your seat to do it, we can bring you a microphone. If you wish to stand here and do it, that's also fine. And there is a sign-up sheet on the notice board in the entrance hall. If you want to add your name or speak to a steward afterwards, then please do. We'd love to have you as part of our worship. So we thank you for that. Are there any birthdays or special celebrations that we need to mention today? No? Okay. Um, so I'll just open in prayer and then we'll carry on with the Lent liturgy for today. So Father God, we thank you for meeting with us here this morning. We thank you for your uh, presence in our lives, for your constant care for us, Lord. And uh, we pray for Martin as he brings uh, his service to us this morning. And we know, Lord, that he's um, uh, been chatting to you about it as to what, what to deliver and how to serve you best. And so, we, Lord, Lord, we hold him before you and ask you to take away any sense of nervousness that he might have, any hesitation at all, Lord, that will be gone. And he can do that in your strength, Father. And uh, we uh, also welcome Andy. And, uh, Look forward to receiving Holy Communion later in the service, Lord, so that we can um, um, meet with you in that special way. So, Father, um, thank you for your love, for your care, and for your uh, welcome to us all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So the liturgy today is pure and spotless, let us be. Unbounded, Holy God, we thank you deeply that you deeply love all people and that you call us to help you turn the tables of injustice and poverty. Lord Jesus, we place this furniture at the foot of the cross to remind us that you were angry when you, the holy place was spoilt by selfishness, greed and exclusion. Holy God, pure and Thank you. Good morning, everyone.
everyone. Thank you for the, the welcome and the kind comments. Um, for, for those of you who have asked and for those who are wondering, Paula got to Iona with no problems on Friday. Um, her travels were fine. Um, and we will get a bit of a refund from GNER because the train was later arriving in Edinburgh, but uh, no problems with connections. Seas were calm, weather's fine and sunny, so really nice. And uh, yeah, she's got a, a nice room which is within an easy walk of where she'll be working, so thank you. We've been reminded already, today is the third Sunday in Lent. We're getting closer to e Easter. The main focus of our readings and hymns today is the temple, God's house. And we'll also be looking at, got briefly, at God's response to injustice and how the church can grow in love. At some point in the service, you'll be invited to stand. This is only an invitation. Please sit or stand as you feel most comfortable. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. I had decided on the first hymn that I'd used today before Sharon used it a fortnight ago. However, since we're having communion today, we can, we can sing all four verses. So you're invited to stand as we sing, Jesus calls us now to meet him, which is number 28 in Singing of Faith. Jesus calls us now to meet him.
Let's just pray. <coughs> Loving Father God, we have come to worship you. Help us to remember that you are here with us. May we pray to you in faith, sing your praise with gratitude, and listen to your word with eagerness through Christ our Lord. O oh, Father God, we come to you because of your love for us. We respond to that love with our love for you. Father God, you are so Loving, we can't but not return your love, although our love is weak. We do love you, Father. We praise your name. We praise you for your glory, your might, your splendour, hidden in light inaccessible, hid from our eyes, but accessible through the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. We praise you for the power you exerted when you brought all things into being. By your word, the heavens were made, and all their hosts, for the breath of your voice, we praise you, Father, for your power in creation. We praise you, Father, for the power that you demonstrated through your prophets, the mighty deeds and the mighty words that they carried out and spoke. We praise you even more for the power that you exerted through your Son, Jesus Christ, in his earthly ministry. We praise you for the power you exerted when you raised him from the dead and seated him at your right hand. We praise you for your glory. But Father, when we think about your nature, your holiness and your loving kindness, we realise how far short we fall. We know there are unkind things that we've done and unkind words that we've said. We know that there have been times when we failed to do or say what we should have done or said, and we are sorry. There are times when others have hurt us and we've not forgiven them. In silence now, we confess to you those things that we are ashamed of and we ask your forgiveness. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. This is his gracious word. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. Thanks be to God. We now have our first reading, which I think Pat will be reading for us, from 1 Kings. Yes, the reading is from the first book of Kings, chapter 8, verses 1 to 11. Then King Solomon summoned into his presence at Jerusalem the elders of Israel, all the heads of the tribes and the chiefs of the Israelite families, to bring up the Ark of the Lord's Covenant from Zion, the city of David. All the men of Israel came together to King Solomon at the time of the festival in the month of Ethanim, the seventh month. When all the elders of Israel had arrived, the priests took up the ark and they brought up the ark of the Lord at the tent of meeting and all the sacred furnishings in it. The priests and Levites carried them up and King Solomon and the entire assembly of Israel that had gathered about him were before the ark, sacrificing so many sheep and cattle that they could not be recorded or counted. The priests then brought the Ark of the Lord's Covenant to its place in the inner sanctuary of the temple, the most holy place, and put it beneath the wings of the cherubim. The cherubim spread their wings over the place of the Ark and overshadowed the Ark and its carrying poles. These poles were so long that their ends could be seen from the holy place in front of the inner sanctuary, but not from outside the holy place, and they are still there today. There was nothing in the ark except the two stone tablets that Moses had placed in it at Horeb, where the Lord made a covenant with the Israelites after they came out of Egypt. When the priests withdrew from the holy place, a cloud filled the temple of the Lord, 
and the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled his temple. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Pat. The big day had arrived. The building work was completed. The excitement was growing. The crowds watched as the church's minister, <coughs> along with the circuit superintendent and the chair of district, walked up the steps to the front door. There they were met by the main contractor and the architect and were handed the keys. They entered the brand new worship area and were followed by members of the congregation who filled every available seat. The organist began to play and the choir started to sing an anthem in praise of God. New worship in a new place. What would the future hold? Sadly, those of us who were here last Sunday will know the answer to that question. The church described in the video at the beginning of the first of the first video was the one that I grew up in. The church was open, the extension, including the worship area, was built when I was in my early teens, or just before my teens, and it was demolished and replaced by an apartment block by the time I was 60, after the members stopped loving each other. Let's leave that rather depressing picture of Surrey in the 1980s to 2000s and travel back nearly 3,000 years. The temple commissioned by the great King David and built on the orders of his son, King Solomon, was complete and our reading describes the opening ceremony. All the people of Israel attended. The elders and priests carried the ark up the steps and places in the most holy place. As they carried it, sheep and oxen, almost without number, were sacrificed in honour and praise of God. The gold which covered every surface was glinting in the sunlight. All was in place. Worship was about to begin. Then God turned up. A cloud filled the place. The priest couldn't stand to minister. Wow! Would hardly do justice to the scene. New worship in a new temple, what would the future hold? Sadly, within about 40 years, the people had stopped loving God, forgotten his glory, and most of the valuable items in the temple had been removed in a raid by the Egyptians. And in less than 400 years, the temple itself was destroyed. Sadly, building in brick or stone or even gold-plated cedarwood doesn't guarantee that God's house will stand. How can we build a house that will stand? Let us make sure that we're building God's house in love. And we're invited to sing, stand as we sing, let us build a house where love can dwell, which will be 409 in singing the faith. Let us build a house where love can stand. Amen. Yeah. 
that is not man-made, that is to say, not part of his creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, that he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer, heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean, sanctify them, so they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, how much more does this blood cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God? Thanks be to God for those words. Our New Testament reading will be from John chapter 2, verses 13 to 22. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found men selling cattle, sheep and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip of cords and drove all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, Get out, get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews demanded of him, what miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. The Jews replied, it has taken us 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days. But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Our next hymn reflects on Jesus' anger when he saw the selling and trading in the, in the, in the temple, turning it into a marketplace. You're invited to stand and sing as we sing, Love Inspired This Anger, number 253, in Singing the Faith. <coughs> Three days. 
Here we are on the third Sunday of Lent, looking at Jesus in the early days of the final week of his earthly life and ministry. All four Gospels describe the cleansing of the temple by Jesus. Each of them include slightly different details. Matthew and Luke indicated that it happened immediately after Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Mark tells us it happened the following day. Luke doesn't mention the money changers or name anything that was being sold. Mark adds that the temple was to be a house of prayer for all nations. John's account differs in a number of ways. John mentions that sheep and cattle were being sold as well as doves. He mentioned that Jesus made a whip of cords. He mentions Jesus' comments about his father's house being a marketplace. He also describes the conversation between Jesus and the religious leaders. Finally, John placed the story at the very beginning of his account, rather than during the last week of Jesus' earthly ministry. This last point has led to the suggestion by some commentators that Jesus cleansed the temple on two separate occasions. William Barclay in his commentary suggests that this is unlikely. If Jesus had done this action on one occasion before, he would certainly have been stopped before he could put in a repeat. Barclay also makes the point that John is less interested in relating incidents in chronological order but aims to get to the truth behind the facts, the truth that Jesus was the Son of God and Messiah. I want to consider three separate points in my sermon today, which all relate in different ways to the temple, and hopefully we'll see how they relate to each other. So firstly, God is angry with oppression and dishonesty. Secondly, if we want our house to stand, it must be built on love. And finally, Jesus Christ is the High Priest, the Sacrifice, and the Temple. But let us start with the first point first. God is angry with oppression and dishonesty. The Temple where the action took place was not the same one that we read about earlier in 1 Kings. That Temple was destroyed by the invading Babylonians and a replacement built about 70 years later. The replacement, even though it was a pale imitation, stood for about 500 years before it too was destroyed, this time by the Romans when they invaded Palestine and captured Jerusalem. Finally, the temple that Jesus knew began to take shape under the patronage of King Herod the Great. This was by far the grandest of the temples and construction had been taking place for over 40 years by the time Jesus visited, and it would take another 30 years before it was finally completed. As we heard in our Old Testament reading, the first temple was built as the house for the worship of God by the men of Israel. Although the builders knew that even heaven couldn't contain him, God was pleased for his glory to fill the temple. When the third temple was built, the client base had expanded slightly. There was an area where women could enter, and an outer court that was open to Gentiles who wanted to, to worship God. It was in this outer court that the action in our Gospel reading took place. A temple tax had to be paid, and animals had to be brought for sacrifice. The tax had to be paid in sanctuary shekels, Anyone with any other currency had to have it exchanged at a very poor rate with a large transaction fee. Animals for sacrifice had to be without blemish. If anyone brought their own animal, they had to pay an extortionate fee for an inspection, which almost certainly would lead to a blemish being found. Anyone wishing to buy a certified blemish-free animal had to pay an above-market price and would have to do so using the sanctuary shekels with the same exchange rate rip-off that I've mentioned already. I remember when I visited the pilgrimage sites at Medjugorje in Bosnia and Herzegovina. There were a number of cafes and restaurants all displaying their prices. What many of them didn't do was state whether their price was in Bosnian convertible marks or euros 
which meant the cost was doubled. So there you have that site. When you walk round the, the pilgrimage area, there was a great place of peace and focus on Jesus and, and the words of Mary saying, listen to my son. When you left that area, there was probably about a kilometre long road full of shops selling tat, selling tat. And as I say, these cafes, which may or may not have been ripping off the faithful. But as well as being furious at the way the temple authorities were lining their own pockets at the expense of the poor who were coming to worship God, Jesus was also angry that the only part of the temple where Gentiles could worship was full of crowds buying and selling with the noise of animals and traders. As part of my local preacher training, I've been looking at liberation theology. This developed in Latin America when a number of Roman Catholic priests realised that the abject poverty that they witnessed amongst their congregations was caused by the social structures that the church supported and benefited from. As part of the same work, I looked at ways in which different marginalised people are prevented from entering into worship. From the obvious, such as a flight of stairs that wheelchairs can't, can't, users cannot negotiate, to the more subtle ignoring of people who don't fit our expectations. It would be good to ask ourselves if we're benefiting from a world order that condemns millions to poverty while a few become rich. We could ask ourselves if we're excluding anyone from our fellowship and what are we going to do to bring about change. This brings us to my second point. If we want our house to stand, it must be built on love. As you've already noted, as well as the financial abuse of the poor and the faithful, the religious leaders were also preventing outsiders from coming to worship. And we saw that churches die because of lack of love. How do we prevent that fate befalling our church here in Sprouston? I remember two incidents that happened when I was in my teens. On one occasion, the church was holding a fate. The only time the church I belonged at when I was in my childhood, the only time they related to the outside world was when they had their annual Christmas bazaar, their annual fete, and jumble sales, which were all fundraising events for the church. <coughs> anyway, by the by, one of those church, one of the fetes was happening, and I was standing next to one of the older men in the church, they were probably in their 70s, so they were really, really old. Um, and, and a couple of, a couple of boys who'd been, who were in my class came down the road towards the church, and this man turned to me and said, here come the undesirables. <laughs> now, I knew one of them quite well, and he probably was a bit undesirable, but that was just a, a, an out-of-off-the-cuff comment. Here's a young person, they're undesirable. The other incident happened not long after the new worship area was opened, and the original hall had doubled as a worship area on Sunday, was now available for general use. So the church originally was a, was a hall with a stage, and at the one end of it there was the communion rail and the cross and everything, and during the week that was divided off by a curtain, so you could use it for sort of ladies' meetings and such like. But it was now, all that had been moved into the new worship area. My, my dad was leading the youth club at the time, and he and some others painted badminton court lines on the floor. When one of the other old men, again, one of these really ancient people who were in their 70s, saw, saw these badminton lines, he went absolutely potty. Absolutely potty. What was the message that these two men gave out? I think it was this. We don't care, like or care for young people and we don't want change. I think it was that attitude, that spirit, that culture that pervaded the church that led to the acrimonious spit in the congregation those years later. How do we measure up? How do we react when young children, to our young children when they behave like children? Do we react with love and a smile? Or do we glare and complain to their parents? When people have needs that we don't know about, come, do we welcome them and try to meet their needs? Or do we complain about how much food they're eating? 
Do we embrace change or are we agitating for a return to the way things were before? Let us develop a genuine love for each other and for all and let us seek to grow closer to God and to each other. Let us embrace the new things that God is doing in our lives, our church and our society. I now want to come to my final point. Jesus Christ is the High Priest, the Sacrifice and the Temple. The letter to the Hebrews was probably written in about 80 AD. The Temple in Jerusalem had been destroyed, never to be rebuilt. The tents made in the wilderness had long since rotted away. There was in any case no longer a need for them. For more than 1400 years, with some interruptions due to their apostasy and, and exile, the people of Israel had brought their sacrifices to tent and temple. The sacrifices were burnt on the altar, which was situated firstly in the tabernacle's courtyard and then outside the entrance to the temple. I'd never really thought about that before, that the, the, the altars were actually outside of the temple, outside of the tabernacle and outside of the temple. When you think about it, you wouldn't actually want a raging fire inside a tent. And just imagine the smoke damage done to the inside of a building when you've got a fire with sort of animals being sort of burnt to, to, to ashes inside it. It's amazing what you don't realise during sort of 70 years and suddenly the penny drops. But then on one day each year, the high priest would enter the most holy place with the blood of a sacrificed animal, which was sprinkled on the Ark of the Covenant to make atonement for the people's sins. No one else could approach God to draw near. No one apart from priests could even enter the temple itself. The writer to the Hebrews made the bold statement that Jesus Christ is the High Priest of the New Covenant and had the right to enter the most holy place with the blood of the sacrifice. When he died on the cross, the curtain holding the Holy of Holies from sight and barring entrance was torn in two. Jesus entered where only the high priest could off, go to offer, not the blood of an animal in this case, but his own blood as the ultimate sacrifice. All our sins were atoned for. Who thinks that's really good news? You know, I see some nods and a hand going up that section. Is it really good news? Yes, absolutely. Praise the Lord. The temple really was an impressive edifice, looking, at, looking like it could stand forever. But there was Jesus saying he could rebuild it in three days. At his trial, that this claim was the only piece of evidence that had the required two witnesses. What did he mean? As we saw earlier, the temple was the house of God. His presence filled it. Jesus was God in human form, God in dwelling within him. In a very real way, he was the house of God. Simple but profound, our God contracted to a span. I hope you'll agree that there are some things we need to ponder, some attitudes we might need to change. We might need to share God's anger at things which make him angry, but we know that our church will stand if we build it in love and that we can be built into God's temple as part of a holy priesthood forever. Amen. You are invited to stand as we sing, Heaven shall not wait. God has already acted and we must follow his lead. From singing the faith 701, Heaven shall not wait.
our offerings for the work of God in this church and circuit will now be collected. Father, we thank you for all that you have given to us. We know that we cannot give you anything that you have not given us in the first place. Please accept these offerings as tokens of our commitment to a life of serving you. We ask that, you would, that money would be spent wisely and effectively in extending your kingdom here and throughout the world. Amen. <laughs> Let us pray. Father, when you created the world, you saw that it was good. Everything that you made was perfect. Sadly, due to sin, many things are very far from perfect. And we hold before you some of those areas in the world that are in trouble at the moment. Father, we hold before you Israel and Palestine, and particularly the people of Gaza. Lord, we just can't imagine how dreadful life must be for the people there. Father, we, we pray for the people whose, whose leaders are not serving their best interests. Leaders on both sides of the divide, seeking only their own power. Lord, we pray that you would over overthrow those who are seeking power for their own benefits. We pray that the people of Israel and Palestine would be free. And Father, we hold the people of Ukraine and Russia before you, Lord. Those in Ukraine who have lost loved ones and, and, and houses and land. And the people of Russia who are suffering with their losses. <coughs> A leader who doesn't care for his own people, but only for his own power. Lord, we pray that you would overcome and defeat the despots and those who seek power only for their own good. We hold all the places in the world that are having elections this year. Our own country will be having them. The United States, many other countries, Lord, many of these elections will be shams. Many of them won't be free and fair. Lord, we pray for freedom and fairness in your world. We hold our own government before you, Lord, and we, th we think of the budget that's coming up. Lord, we pray for wise decision-making at the heart of government. We hold our king and royal family before you, Lord, and, and pray for our king's recovery from his treatment and for other members of the royal family who've had surgery and who, who are unwell at this time. And Lord, we come closer to home. We pray for our own circuit. We think of the services that are taking place at the moment around the circuit. We pray that your Holy Spirit will pour out upon those places. As the circuit continues its review and, and looking to the future, we pray that you will guide it wisely. We pray for our own church here in Sprouston. We pray that your kingdom would grow here, Lord. We pray that many would hear the message of Jesus' love for them. And Father, we now think of those who we know who are ill or bereaved or have other difficulties. In silence now, we remember them.
And Father, we join all our prayers together in saying the, the prayer that Jesus taught us, using the words that have rejected. Our Father in heaven, may your name be hallowed, may your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Do not bring us to the time of trial, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We now come to our communion, which Andy will take over and lead for us. one flesh and one blood, one in the body of Christ. 
Let us live to sing your praise and show your love to all until our wilderness wandering is over and we share the feast with you forever in the land that you have promised. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory is yours, O God, now and always. Amen. Jesus reminds us that he is the way and the truth and the life. We may know him by partaking in these elements representative of his sacrifice, the body and blood. You're invited to come and share in the sacraments of Holy Communion.
come to our final hymn, which is now Let Us From This Table Rise. And that reflects on the fact that we've, we've been fed in the communion so that we can go out to serve the world in God's name. So let us, you're invited to stand as we sing, Now Let Us From This Table Rise. Be with us all, everyone. 